when I began to deal with the issue of, of Israel and the melanated people being true Israel, I received quite a few comments on my uh, in the chat, as well as some emails and a few phone calls um, advising me or cautioning me uh, to understand that if I continue to go down that trail, then I am going to have to renounce Christianity. And I couldn't figure out why, you know, why people were taking that position. Uh, but I have come to understand that within many of the communities, within many of the camps, uh, in dealing with what has become known as Hebrew Israelites, um, one would be led to that conclusion that there is uh, somehow some disconnect between being in the natural or being in the flesh, a descendant of Israel, and then being as is defined commonly as a Christian. Um, and I use the label Christian lightly. When I am referring to Christians, I'm talking about people who are followers of Jesus, those who are followers of Yeshua, those who are followers of Yahashua, uh, whichever pronunciation people feel is appropriate. Um, but for me and for many people that I've been in conversation with, there is no contradiction between realizing that you are in fact ethnically Hebraic, yet you are a follower of Jesus, who is in fact Israel's Messiah. So it
Surely, goodness and mercy is going to follow me all the days of my life. I want to welcome everybody to the conversation today. My name is, of course, Daryl Arnez. I am with Emergent Ministries, and you are watching More Sure word which is the media outreach of emergent ministries we are located in lago florida that would be just outside of the tampa bay area well again i want to welcome you uh to the conversation i have a uh word that i want to share with you this evening that i believe is going to be um very challenging for many people um, I'm aware that many of you are uh, abreast of a lot of the conversation that has recently begun to surface um, within not just the body of Christ, but within uh, culture at large relative to uh, the belief that the African-American, the Negro, uh, the black man, the colored, uh, the melanated people, um, are in fact a part of true Israel. And while I do hold to that position, there are some very differences within uh, those communities and within those camps when it has to do or when it comes to understanding the nation of, of Israel. And, and, and I've been touching on that over the last couple of conversations, and I want to continue uh, along that vein with the conversation today uh, regarding Hebrew or Israelite. Now, some people may be saying, well, that, that's a very interesting topic, but let me share for just a moment uh, how I arrived at wanting to do this particular uh, conversation. When I began to deal with the issue of, of Israel and the melanated people being true Israel, I received quite a few comments on my uh, in the chat, as well as some emails and a few phone calls um, advising me or cautioning me uh, to understand that if I continue to go down that trail, then I am going to have to renounce Christianity. And I couldn't figure out why, you know, why people were taking that position. Uh, but I have come to understand that within many of the communities, within many of the camps, uh, in dealing with what has become known as Hebrew Israelites, um, one would be led to that conclusion that there is uh, somehow some disconnect between being in the natural or being in the flesh, a descendant of Israel, and then being as is defined commonly as a Christian. Um, and I use the label Christian lightly. When I am referring to Christians, I'm talking about people who are followers of Jesus, those who are followers of Yeshua, those who are followers of Yahashua, uh, whichever pronunciation people feel is appropriate. Um, but for me and for many people that I've been in conversation with, there is no contradiction between realizing that you are in fact ethnically Hebraic, yet you are a follower of Jesus, who is in fact Israel's Messiah. So it, it, it shouldn't really be a contradiction to understand that following Jesus is kind of the natural outgrowth of, of, 
uh, being of the Hebraic faith, but for many people, they don't seem to be able to separate the two. So what I want to do um, in this particular conversation is to speak to the reality of how natural it is to be a Hebrew and follow the Messiah of the nation of Israel. So before we go any further, I do want to have a word of prayer, but I want to invite you to share. I want to invite you to like, I want to uh, invite you to subscribe to this channel so that you can view many of the different teachings that have been done for your uh, edification and for your spiritual uh, enrichment. Um, but having said that, let's pray and let's 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 get into this conversation because I believe it is going to richly bless you. And if you if you know anyone who is struggling um, behind this message of Israel, behind uh, this message of the identity of uh, melanated people, people of color being true Israel. If you know people who are struggling with that message, I want to invite you to just share the link to this conversation because it is going to answer a number of questions and it's really going to put some things into proper perspective or as I like to say, is going to bring some balance to the particular message um, that is being dealt with um, within the body and within the broader uh, cultural uh, society in which we live. So let's pray and let's jump into uh, the scriptures. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The one that we have been informed that when he the spirit of truth has come. He will lead and guide us into all truth. And so, Father, we trust and we rely upon the leading of the Holy Spirit. We welcome and acknowledge the presence of the teacher. And we give you praise. We give you glory and we give you honor in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Well, I want to pick up where I left off of the last conversation and we begun to lay the foundation for this particular um, conversation that we're having. But I want to reiterate that it is only through Israel did God offer salvation. So only through Israel was salvation offered. Only Israel had the oracles of God. Only Israel uh, had been brought into relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth. Only Israel was brought into covenant relationship with the God who in the beginning said, let there be light. Only Israel was given the knowledge of the true and the living God. Now, unfortunately, many people believe that that salvation that was offered through Israel was only offered to Israel. And it's, it's kind of being promoted that way today, that only Israel can be saved. And so if if we accept the premise that melanated people are in fact true Israel, that only melanated people can be saved. In fact, the salvation of God is only for Israel. And, and we're going to look at scripture and we're going to show from scripture that that is not quite the case. Salvation was offered through Israel to all of the other nations. And it is important to understand, and it's important to keep in mind um, that that salvation is offered again through 
Israel, but it's offered to all. So right from the very first covenant that God made with Abraham, and we're going to look, we're going to look at some scriptures here, but that covenant that God made with Abram was this, and we're going to see this in the book of Genesis, and we're going to look at Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to read through verse 3. So Abraham was called by God, and in chapter 12, this is what the scripture reads. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and from your kindred and from your father's house, and I want you to go to the land that I'm going to show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse, and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. So again, we see God calls Abraham, and he calls him out from his family, out from his kindred, out from the folk who were like him. This is the call of God. And he said, you, you come out from them and I'm going to make of you a great nation. Now I pointed out in the last conversation that when we're reading Genesis chapter 12 and we're reading about the call of Abram, it's important to understand the call of God, understand the call to Abram in light of Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 11, which was the amalgamation of the nations from the flood of Noah and how they all gathered in, in the plain of Shinar and they built in the plain of Shinar a tower, which we know infamously as the Tower of Babel. This would be all of the nations who were descended from Shem, Ham, and Japhet, which were the sons of Noah. This is after the worldwide flood, and Noah and his family were preserved on the ark. They were given a covenant to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. God blessed the family of Noah. Now remember, God had also blessed Adam and Eve before their transgression. So it is the intent of God to reverse the curse that came into the earth through Adam's transgression. So God is constantly finding a people that he can bless, and through that people he desires to reach all families of the earth. So he calls Abram and he tells Abram, Abram, I want you to come out and I'm going to make of you a great nation. So I want you to understand that this nation that God is going to bring into being through Abram is a nation that is separate from all of the nations who were populated after the flood of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth's descendants populated the earth. God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees to make a nation. Abraham was not an Israelite. Abram was not a Jew. He was not a Judaite. He was neither of the house of Israel nor of the house of Jacob. At the time Abram was called, there was no nation known as Israel. Therefore, Abram is referred to in scripture as a Hebrew. Isaac is referred to as a Hebrew and the word Hebrew means one who has crossed over. So he has crossed over this great river 
in that time, and he's going into the land of Canaan. Y'all stay with me. He's coming out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he's going to the land that was inhabited by the Canaanites. He's going to receive that as an inheritance. And God promises to bless him. But the point that I want to show, the thing that I want to point out is that God said, I'm going to bless you, but in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now y'all stay with me. It has always been the intent of God for humanity to carry his blessing and to manifest his image in the earth. So the work of redemption, the offer of salvation is an offer to bring humanity back into covenant with the creator so that they can still carry the blessing of God and they can still execute in the earth the image, the plan, and the purpose of God. This is original intent and design. So the reason that God chose Israel was the gospel. Y'all stay with me now. <laughs> The reason God chose Israel was the gospel. God's purpose for Israel was to bring the gospel to the world. Now, amazingly, many people who claim to be Israel today take issue with the gospel. They take issue with the person of Jesus Yeshua, Yahashua, whichever, whichever, again, whichever language you want to say the name, the, the, the language does not distort nor pervert the master's purpose. Okay, so I don't, we don't want to get caught up in the confusion of the proper pronunciation of a name. What's important is that we have a proper relationship with the person. So through the gospel, humanity is to be cleansed from sin and regain their purpose in the earth. Uh, we covered that in the first, in part one and part two of when Hebrews awake. So you might want to go back and listen to those particular conversations so that you have all of the parts there. But through the gospel, humans are cleansed from sin rebellion, transgression, and they regain their purpose in the earth to exercise dominion and authority. Please understand, if you don't get anything else out of this message, please understand the purpose of salvation, the purpose of redemption, the purpose of reconciliation is to restore us back to the original plan and position that we had before Adam transgressed. The purpose of salvation is not to get us to heaven. The purpose of salvation is to get heaven into us. So this is what the gospel is dealing with. Now, the next thing I want to point out is that it's through Israel that the Messiah came. It's through Israel that the Messiah of Israel came. We're talking about the reason of Israel's being. So in Galatians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 7 through 9. Galatians chapter 3 verses 7 through 9, and it reads this. So you see, well, let's back up and let's start at verse 6, and we'll, we'll deal with a little bit of this. But it reads, just as Abraham believed God, hmm, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, or it was charged to his account, it was credited to him 
for righteousness. So you see, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. Now, this is very important because a lot of people miss this. Those who believe are descendants of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the Gentiles or all the nations shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. So again, the gospel is that through Abraham, all who believe would be blessed, would be justified. It's through believing the gospel. This is what proves our true descendancy from Abraham. It's not the clothes that we wear. It's, it's not... Uh, whether or not we have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's, it's not whether or not we have fringes on our garments. It's not whether or not we dress in purple and gold. It's not whether or not we, we, we garb ourselves and wear, you know, little caps on our head. That makes us Israel. No, what makes us Israel is two things. Number one, we are born as descendants of Israel. That's number one. And that we believe the gospel as our father Abraham believed. Because only those who believe are blessed with Abraham. Believe what? Believe the gospel. Y'all stay with me now. I cannot tell you how central that point alone is. We have to keep Israel's Messiah central to the message, or the only thing we're going to end up with is another religion. And we're going to see what's happened with a lot of people. We're going to see how in many cases, in trying to prove natural identity, people are actually falling from grace and going back up under the law. Now, y'all stay with me. To see how God offers salvation through the world, through Israel, it's, it's important to note to fulfill God's purpose, another, now watch, and a better Israel would be required because we know that Israel fell and we know God knew Israel was going to fall. God knew that. But it was still God's plan. It was still God's intent. And God put the gospel in motion after, first of all, proclaiming it to Abram, the Hebrew. So watch. If, if you look at Isaiah chapter 49, and we're going to read verses, we'll start at verse 5. This is what God says to the prophet Isaiah, because God needs Israel to do a certain thing. And because the nation of Israel would be unable to do it because of the weakness of the flesh, God would bring in true Israel. Stay with me. In Isaiah chapter 49, I'm going to read verses five and six. It says, and now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God has become my salvation. This is the word speaking. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob 
and to restore the survivors of Israel, but I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. He says, I'm going to give you, not only will you be my servant and not only will you uh, raise up the tribes of Jacob and not only would you restore the survivors of Israel, but I'm going to give you as a light. I'm going to give you as a revelation. I'm going to give you as a focal point for all the nations of the earth regarding my offer of salvation. This is through the prophet Isaiah that God is speaking. So this servant Israel, right? This one who was formed in the womb. And this is talking about the incarnation. This is talking about God manifesting himself in the flesh, in the person of Jesus. This servant, Israel, did in fact take flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus. Y'all stay with me now. This is the incarnation. From the moment of his birth, Jesus, in fact, reenacted Israel's history from birth. You'll remember that when he was first born and Herod was out to get him, that the angel of the Lord had warned Joseph in a dream to take the young child and his mother and go down into Egypt. You remember that. Matthew chapter 2 verse 15 and he's quoting Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 out of Israel or out of Egypt have I called my son you'll remember that after Israel was led out of the land of Egypt they passed through the Red Sea in the same way Jesus passed through the waters of baptism in Matthew chapter 3, before he was led out into the wilderness, where he successfully faced the same temptations that Israel failed to endure. You'll read about that in Matthew chapter 4. So we see Jesus going down into Egypt. Then we see him coming out of Egypt, passing through the waters of baptism as Israel passed through the Red Sea. And then we see him go into the wilderness where he had to face the same exact temptations that Israel after the flesh faced during their wilderness experience. But they failed their test in the wilderness, which is why they were condemned to wander for 40 years until that unbelieving generation died in the wilderness. So at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, Jesus quotes out of the book of Isaiah. So let's read Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. This is why, as I say, there's no conflict. There's 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 no oxymoron. There's there's no issue with me being rooted and grounded as a follower of Jesus, though I recognize my Hebraic ancestry. Though I understand that I am in fact a descendant of the tribe of Judah. That does not in any way impact my foundation as a follower of Jesus the Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach at all. It actually brings it into proper perspective. It actually opens up the scripture even more so I understand uh, some things that were a little difficult for me to comprehend prior to. But Jesus reads out of Isaiah chapter 61, and he reads this. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Uh, He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty 
to the captives and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. So the Lord has sent me to do certain things. This is the servant of the Lord that we read about in Isaiah 49. This is the purpose of the servant of the Lord coming into the earth. Jesus quotes that in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, and then tells the people listening, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So even those today who claim to be Israelites, claim to be Isra Hebrew Israelites, claim to be of Judah, yet they deny the Messiahship of Jesus they're still in unbelief. That's why the fathers were broken off. That's what kicked the curses of Deuteronomy in big time. As far as Judah is concerned, was the rejection of the Messiah in AD 70. Paul tells us in Romans that the natural branches were broken off because of unbelief, but writing to the Gentiles, he says, you stand by faith, so don't boast over the branches that were broken off because the branches that were broken off because of unbelief will be grafted back in if they do not still remain in unbelief. This is part of of the raising up of the tribes of Jacob. This is why Hebrews have to awake, especially those of us who are descended from the tribe of Judah. We are in days of restoration. We are in the days of the vengeance of our God. Hallelujah. That's Luke chapter four. So he was himself the promised servant upon whom the spirit of God rested. And so as the new Israel, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the demands and the requirements of the law. <laughs> Stay with me. As the new Israel, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the demands of the law. So he could say, think not that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to destroy them. I came to fulfill them. And he did fulfill them and brought in the renewed covenant that Jeremiah anticipated and prophesied would come. You'll find that in Jeremiah 31 and in Jeremiah 33, where he talks about this new covenant, this renewed covenant. This is the covenant that was established and confirmed by Jesus through his blood, which he spoke to the apostles about at the Last Supper or that Passover celebration that they had, Luke chapter 22. So Jesus fulfills God's original design for human holiness and as the result, he personally, literally embodies the new Israel for which the prophets looked. This is why Peter could talk about the prophets that prophesied. They didn't, they didn't know what they were prophesying about. He says, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, was testifying when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow. Folk, the law and the prophets both point to Israel's Messiah, which is Jesus. That is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. It has always been God's design that the second man, the last Adam, Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Ghost, would embody perfection in the flesh. This is fulfilling God's original design for Adam, for humanity. Jesus embodies that. 
we cannot reject Jesus and claim to be a covenant people. We just can't do it. Many people are trying to do it. And what they have is another form of Pharisaic Judaism. That's a lot of actually what's being preached as Hebrew Israelitism is Pharisaic Judaism. And I have a teaching on the tradition of the elders as well, if you'd like to go back and, and, and watch that, and that will help to understand what the real New Testament conflict or conflict is really all about. So God's purpose for Israel was not to bring the law to the world as a solution to the world's problems. So why do we keep preaching the law? The law, the law, Deuteronomy 28, this Deuteronomy 28, that Deuteronomy 28, the other thing, and that these curses that have come upon Israel as a result of them rejecting the covenant. And this is, this seems to be, uh, central in, in, a, in a lot of these conversations, despite the fact that the new covenant or the renewed covenant tells us Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. So we don't get up from under the curse of Deuteronomy because we awaken to the fact that we're descendants of true Israel. That's not how we get from up under the curse. You can recognize that you are a Hebrew, you are an Israelite, you are a Judaite, and you can wear tassels on your clothes, and, and you can drape yourself in prayer shawls, and you can learn how to speak Hebrew, and, and you can do all of that. But the reality is, if you're rejecting Israel's Messiah, you're still under a curse, because the only way to come from up under the curse is through Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. Israel's purpose was not to bring the law to the world as a solution to the world's problems. Because Israel without Christ was never meant to be God's solution for anything. They're just another nation, if that's the point. So outside of Israel, uh, being in covenant relation with Christ, they cannot fulfill their purpose. They can't even know what their purpose is. So if the law... This is a question. If the law was not meant to be a solution, what was the purpose of the law being given to Israel? If, if the law was not meant to be a solution, what was the purpose that the law was given to Israel? I'm so glad that you asked. You see, when you go back and you start understanding something about original intent and purpose, it goes a long way with helping to keep your understanding clear. And this is why I believe so much of institutional Christianity tends to have such a divergence of doctrine and teaching when it comes to scripture is because in far too many cases, they don't start with the original plan and purpose of God. They try to pick up two thirds of the way into the story, and then they create a gospel that they then present to people, but it tends to ignore the foundation upon which the gospel is built which would be the call of Abraham and God's desire to reach all families of the earth. So in Galatians chapter three, again, we're going to read starting in verse 19. And it says, why then the law? The law was added because of transgressions until the seed or the offspring would come 
to whom the promise had been made. And it was ordained through angels by a mediator. Now, a mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. So the law was given so that we would have an understanding of, number one, what sin was. And this is what Paul deals with in the book of Romans. He said, I would not have known what it meant to covet had the law not said thou shalt not covet. I wouldn't have known um, what idolatry was if, if, the, if the law hadn't have said not to make graven images. I wouldn't have known. So by the law, we gain a knowledge of sin. That's all we gain from the law. The law will also give us types and shadows through the sacrificial system of the coming work of the Messiah. So we can understand that this, this day of atonement, this sheep that would be offered for the remission of sin, that these turtle doves, these pigeons, all of these washings, and which are types of cleansings, all of these things were only types and shadows given to point to the Messiah until the seed would come, who is Christ, to whom the promise was made. It was to Abraham and to his seed. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So let's keep going. Galatians 3. And let's start reading verse 21. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. If there had not been a law that could have been given, that could have made alive, if there was a law given that could have raised humanity from being dead in trespasses and sin because of Adam's transgression, if there was a law that could have been given, then a law would have been given. But the scripture says, if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would have indeed come through the law. So if there was a law that could be given that could, number one, make people alive unto God, if there was a law given that could have done that, and then people keep that law, then righteousness or right standing with the Father would have come through the law. But there was no law that could be given. This work had to be done internally. There had to be a change of nature, not a change simply of your belief, there has to be a change of nature. So Jesus could say to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You were born wrong. You must be born again. All right. So he says this, but the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin. Remember, by one man, sin came into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men because all men sinned. We sinned in Adam. Adam can only bring forth what Adam is. When Adam fell, his nature was corrupted. So the only thing he can bring forth are children who have corrupted natures. So there was the need for a new creation. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17 can tell us, if any man be in Christ, the second man, the last Adam, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So people say, well, but that doesn't answer the question. Are you a Hebrew or Christian? I'm both. And there's no contradiction. Stay with me. So he says, the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin so that what was promised through faith in Jesus might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were imprisoned and we were guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our schoolmaster, King James says. My translation reads, therefore the law was our disciplinarian 
until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. True Israel is a people of faith. True Israel is a people of vision. True Israel. So that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. We don't need the schoolmaster anymore. Why? Because we have the master. We don't need the law to instruct us anymore in that sense. Why? Because we have the teacher. We have the Holy Ghost who teaches us all things. We don't have to try to live according to an external code or an external standard. Why? Because we have God via the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, transforming us into the very image of Christ himself, who is the image of the invisible God. Remember God's original intent. Let's make man in our image. This is God's original intent, and this is what God has been and continues to work towards, is conforming us into his image. This is done through Jesus. This is done by the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. This has nothing to do with wearing fringes, purple and gold. It has nothing to do with that. That is just another form of Pharisaic Judaism. So let's, let's finish this Galatians section up. And it says in verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, because as many of you as were baptized, immersed into Christ, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. So if you want to change the way you dress, glory to God, put on the glory of God that is found in Christ. Put off the old man, be clothed with the new man. People are just, people are just, I, 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 I don't know how to explain it, but it is a little troubling the way that the message of, 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 of Israel, the way that the message of, of the true Judaites, the, you know, all of those truths that are being shared. I mean, folks are sharing the truth of that. There's legitimacy to that claim. But if it is shared apart from the redemptive work of Christ, if it is shared apart from keeping Christ as central, that Jesus is, in fact, the seed of Abraham. He is, in fact, the son of David. He is, in fact, the one that the law and the prophets pointed to. If we remove that from the message, folk, all we have is a religion. And this is why people bicker over stuff like, well, what's the, the proper way to say his name? Are you listening to me? <laughs> so again, why the law? Scripture says it was added because of transgressions. Until the seed would come to who the promise was made. Are you listening? It was added. What was added? <laughs> the law. It was added because of transgression. So why would you want to go back? It reminds me of what, of what Paul said in the book of Galatians. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, uh, who has bewitched you? How are you so soon removed uh, from the gospel? He says, uh, Galatians chapter one, he says this. He said, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and you are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you. 
And this is what a lot of Hebrew Israelites are doing. They're confusing a lot of people. Um, they're confusing. Mm, mm, mm. They're confusing people and they want to pervert the gospel of Christ. He said, even if we are an angel from heaven, if we proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we have proclaimed, let that person be accursed. It, this was already happening with the book of Galatians. There were the Judaizers who were teaching Gentiles that they needed to become Jew first. They needed to convert to Judaism first. They needed to be circumcised. They needed to keep Torah. They needed to do all of these things first before they could accept Israel's Messiah. And Paul totally disputes that. And this is probably why many of them today want to question the authenticity of the writings of the Apostle Paul. This stuff ran, runs hand in hand. So they want to dispute the writing of the Apostle Paul or say, well, people don't really understand Paul. No, people understand Paul. It's that when people reject Israel's Messiah, their eyes are blinded to the reality of what the scriptures are even talking about. And they become religionists. They become legalists and they become very exclusive. So they hold, as we started with, that only Israel can be saved. Translation today, only black folk can be saved. Folks, the scriptures teach nothing remotely similar to that. The gospel went to the Gentiles as well. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's trying to bless all families of the earth. That would be the descendants of Shem, Ham, and even Japheth. Even Japheth. Even those who <laughs> call themselves Jews and are not. God wants to redeem them as well. But it takes true Israel to carry the gospel in the power of the spirit to the ends of the earth. All right. So the law was not God's solution for mankind's problem. When Adam and Eve sinned, every human being was destined to be sinful because Adam could only bring forth what Adam was. Our main problem was not only that we had to have our bad deeds wiped away, we need that, but the deeper problem is we ourselves are bad before we come to Christ, thus we are unable to reign as God's children and we are unable to fulfill his purpose for us. Folk, we are all born with purpose. But as long as we are disconnected from the creator, not only can we not fulfill our purpose, we won't even know what our true purpose is until we get a revelation of Christ. This is Simon, Matthew 16. Jesus says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Simon answered, some say Jeremiah, some say Moses, one, some say one of the prophets. And Jesus said, but who do you say? And Simon answered, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus says to him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. You don't know who I am based on anything dealing with flesh and blood. You don't know who I am based on miracles. You don't know who I am based upon anything that I've done. Nothing according to the flesh. No amount of human intellect, no amount of reasoning, no amount of logic, Simon, can bring you into an understanding of who I am. Now, it can make you very religious, and I think this is a lot of people's problem. They're very religious, but they don't have a revelation of who Christ is. So then Jesus turns and says, and truly I say unto you, you're Peter, and on this rock, this revelation, I'll build my ecclesia. I'll build my church. The word church 
Greek is ekklesia, and it means a called out assembly. What did God say to Abram? Come out from your kindred, your father's house, people like you, come out. That's what the church actually is. It's a called out community. It's, it's, it's the people who have been called out from among the nations of the earth to take their position in true Israel, Jesus, and as a result of being joined to Christ, they become the promised seed. But this takes the new birth. Even for those of us who are of Israel, just in the natural, we still must be born again. That's why there's no contradiction. So that law, again, was added to show us our transgression. It was to guide us towards the Messiah. It was to guide us like a guardian while we were unable to obey God. It's just like young heirs today. They have to have guardians because they're too immature to handle their inheritance on their own. So it's put into what we call a trust. And there are, there, we call it legally, it's a guardianship. And they manage the affairs of the, of the person until they reach a certain age of maturity and accountability to where they can handle their own affairs. This is what the law was for us. It, it was to guide us in our journey, to bring us to the Messiah. But once we come into an understanding of the Messiah, then we understand what our inheritance is and then we can walk in that inheritance. This is the purpose of God. This is kingdom. This is not religion. This is not churchianity. This is the kingdom of God. Those laws were meant to show us as well what God is like. The law was a shadow into his nature, but we see the true manifestation of the nature of God through God's manifestation of himself in the person of Jesus. So, so Galatians 2 and 21 can tell us. <laughs> I don't nullify the grace of God. Because if righteousness were through the law, Christ died for no purpose. So why are people trying to put people back up under the law today? Because they reject Christ. So they nullify the grace of God that's actually at work in their life and they become legalists. This is oftentimes why there's no grace in their life. This is why many times, you know, you, th there's no presence of the spirit of God. There's, there's only judgment. There's only condemnation. There's only criticism. Why? Because they're absent from the grace of God because they rejected Israel's Messiah. Jesus is not only the true Israel, he's Israel's Messiah. If you reject him, you reject the promise of God. So Israel's purpose under the Old Testament is now Israel's purpose that is being expressed under the renewed covenant among God's people. So many people say, well, did the church replace Israel? Absolutely not. The church is Israel. <laughs> it always has been. Acts talks about the same thing. Stephen refers to the congregation in the wilderness. It has always been the community of faith, those who have been called out. We've gotten tripped up by a lot of Greek teaching about the church to where we set the church up separate from Israel. And then we teach God has 
two people. He has the church, then he has Israel. And the promises that were for Israel were only for Israel, and the promises for the church are only for the church. And so we have this God who's dealing with two people. No, through Christ, he has broken down the middle wall of partition and made both one, which is why the scripture can say that in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. You are all one in Christ. Well, you're all one what? You're all one people. You're all the seed of Abraham. You are all the Israel of God, the servants of the Lord. The church does not replace Israel. Israel is the seedling of the church. In seed form, what we see in Israel is what God's intent is for his people who we call under the renewed covenant, the church. Now, I'm not talking about the institutional church. I'm not talking about the church down the street around the corner on the other block. That's not what I'm talking about, the church. The church is a people. It's the called out people of God that make up Israel. A redeemed people who are able to be in fellowship with God and they're able to fulfill God's purpose. That was God's plan from the beginning. The law that was given to our forefathers was given to guide us until we came of age through Christ. At that time, God did away with the law because now we have the spirit who is now guiding us. Let's look at, let's look at Galatians chapter four real quick. Galatians chapter four. Well, we'll start at verse one. We're just about done. The point is this. Heirs, he says, as long as they are minors, they're no better than slaves. Though they are the owners of all the property, but they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the father. So it is with us. While we were minors, while we were children, while we were immature, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. We were given the law to guide us to Christ. When the fullness of the time came, Christ came. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. He's not taking us back up under the law. He's putting us in Christ and we have received the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, because we have received the adoption. This is one of the other things that I find strikingly interesting that many people like to and, and I'm going to take it that they're doing it out of respect, but they make a lot of reference to the most high. Oh, well, the most high glory be to the most high, uh, you know, hallelujah to the most high. And they're giving that reference. Well, the fact of the matter is those who are, th those who are referring to the creator as the most high are referring to the believer's father who we know and we cry out, Abba, Father, because we are now in a relationship 
with the creator. We are in a relationship with the most high. So the most high has now become our father through our adoption through Christ. It's a different kind of relationship. It's not a relationship that's dependent on us following external codes. It's a relationship that we have with the Father because we've been born of His Spirit. The Messiah came through Israel and created a new people. Israel was not replaced. It was transformed. And it was also expanded to include Gentiles as well. You remember Isaiah? It's a light thing that, that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I'm going to give you a light to the Gentiles, a light to the nation, and you'll be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Remember what he said to Abram? I will make of you a great nation and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is not exclusive to a nation that we know as Israel, but this is how many people are preaching this today. And, and the reality of the matter is many people are having a problem with it. And I can understand why I, I really can. I can understand why. God now sees his chosen people, not through an ethnic lens, but through Jesus's blood. So there's a lot of conversation about bloodlines. Well, and, 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 and I understand. I, I really do. I understand the importance of knowing who you are ethnically. Right. I understand that. I understand you knowing your bloodline. I understand, you know, how your DNA impacts who you are, how you can show through your DNA that you're connected to the Hebrew people, that through your DNA, you can prove that you're a part of Israel and all of that's good. But if you only stop there, you're stopping short. You'll kind of be like Peter. You know, Peter has some issues. <laughs> Even after receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2, Peter still had a problem accepting Gentiles into the community of faith. So much so, God had to give him a vision three times to let him know what God has cleansed, let no man call unclean. And he was talking about the Gentile nations. And we need to take that into consideration when we're talking about uh, this powerful message of the awakening of the Hebrew, that we understand that we're being awakened, not so we can be exclusive and condemn everybody who's not, but so that we can be restored and so that we can step into our position and that we can execute our purpose in the air, in the earth and sharing the message of God's redemption to all the families of the earth. Because what the bloodline that matters to the father is the bloodline of Jesus. Everyone who has faith in Jesus is a part of Israel. Whether you were born according to the flesh as a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or not. If you have faith in Jesus and if you've been born again, you are part of the covenant people of God. You're a part of God's chosen people and God still only has one chosen people and that's Israel. Please hear me. Israel was not replaced. Those who have faith in Jesus, they are the true children, the true sons and daughters of Abraham. Let's read Galatians chapter three. I'm just about closed, just about done. Verse 28, or let's go to 27 again. Galatians 3, 27. And it reads, as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have 
clothed yourself. You have put on Christ. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Isn't this what much of the argument in, in, in the body of Messiah has been over the past couple hundred years, this issue of who's a Jew, who's a Greek, you know, well, what's the difference with being a slave and being free and, and can, you know, what's the difference with male and female? Can a woman do this? Should a man do that? And, and on and on and on and on and on. And we're missing the true revelation of what God has done in Christ for all people. You see, this is in Christ Jesus. Israel's main purpose under the old covenant was to bring salvation through the world or to the world through being the means through which Jesus came. Now, under the new renewed covenant, we as the body of Messiah, we have the same purpose. That is being the means through which the work of Jesus and the message of the Messiah is delivered to the world in both word and in deed. So again, is it important to know who you are ethnically? Absolutely. Is it important that those of melanation, blacks, Negroes, colored people, is it important that we understand that we are actually descendant from the house of Judah? Absolutely. A a absolutely. That's, that's very important because our identity uh, has been stripped. Our identity has been stolen. Our identity has been buried. Our identity has been lost. Why? Because our forefathers were broken off because of unbelief. But when we come to faith in Christ, we're grafted back in and we gain an understanding of who we are. We can understand now our history. We can understand our experience over the past 2,000 years. More specifically, we can really understand our experience under the over the past 500 years with the transatlantic slave trade. We can understand it. It comes into perspective. It helps us to understand end time prophecy. But we cannot stop there. We have to go forward and we have to embrace our Messiah. Now that we know who we are, now we move into understanding what our purpose is. That is why we are. Hopefully, within this conversation, something has been shared that is going to trigger you to further search your scripture. Search your scriptures first to find out whether or not the things I'm saying are actually so, but then continue to search your scripture so that the spirit of truth can continue to open up the eyes of your understanding to this great awakening that we are encountering so that we can rise up as the restored house of both Israel and the house of Judah, that we are part of those two sticks that are being joined together, that we can be engaged with God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to carry the message of the salvation of God to the ends of the earth. God is aiming at blessing all families of the earth. How is he going to do it? He told Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And the nation of God, true Israel, has always been God's instrument of bringing redemption into the world that all might believe and be redeemed. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions, any comments, if you'd like to discuss uh, these matters any further, 
be sure to email me. My email is on the screen. It will also uh, be in the closing. Uh, you can visit us online at emergentministries.com. You can learn about the, the, the school of ministry that we're doing, some of the classes that we're sharing. And we would just love to have you as a part because I do believe that God is doing some very unique things in the earth in these days. And I'm so glad that I'm a part and I'm glad that you are a part. And I thank you so much for your time, your prayers, your support. If you'd like to be a blessing to the ministry, send me an email, some words of encouragement. That's the best blessing that you can be to the ministry. But to find out more information, here's some information so you can get additional information. Peace and blessing. Shalom, people of God. Amen.